The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So payments part two, uh, we're going to chat a little bit about the uh, overview today. Readings, of course, as we always do. And then, uh, what was yesterday? Does anybody want to tell me what yesterday was? Kelly? 10th anniversary. 10th anniversary of Bitcoin. The white baby. What else was yesterday? Halloween. It was ha Halloween. No, it is not my birthday again. Stop that, Tom. So, we're going to chat a little bit. We're going to have some fun about a uh, happy anniversary or birthday. It, would you call it a birthday or anniversary? Anniversary? Okay. Birthday. All right. There's no established vocabulary really in this field. So. What's that? The birthday. Hugo, why is the birthday come in January? Birthday marks the end. So, music's going to die today. Raheem? Birth means death. Yeah. Anniversary means better. Did you get that? Birth also connotes death. Did I have that? And so Raheem is saying she would go with anniversary. But we have birth over here. We're going to chat a little bit about that and try <laughs> the, the uh, existential. Um, uh, then we're going to talk about payment systems and sort of some of the pain points. Um, and uh, uh, we'll have a lively discussion. What do you think the pain points are in the payment system? I, I of course, will have listed some, but uh, your, your input's the most important. How does blockchain fit into this payment system? And why, so far, haven't there been any really uh, economy-wide or system-wide adoptions yet? Uh, uh, so one might even say, what are the pain points of blockchain technology that there has not yet been some of those uh, adoptions? Um, uh, uh, I'm gonna, we're going to chat a little bit about uh, some payment, blockchain payment companies. And there are not many. Uh, I mean, there are many white papers, but there are not many that have actually taken off. Um, and then wrap it up. So uh, the study questions. Uh, which, which we're going to sort of dig into rather than right now, but just, you know, what lessons can be taken uh, uh, so far? Might layer two uh, help us? We're going to come back to these when we sort of dig into the pain points. Um, what are the opportunities in cross-border and so forth? And the trade-offs of using permission versus permissionless systems. So happy anniversary, happy birthday for some uh, 10 years ago. Uh, it's remarkable. Actually, some people say it was November 1st uh, because I think when it actually got on the website, it was November 1st in parts of the world. So, um, so what, what, what do we know about the 10th anniversary? I, just some fun statistics. This has all happened in 10 years. So the price is around $6,300 of Bitcoin out of nothing. Satoshi Nakamoto, and it's $110 billion in size. Um, we might not all know each other in 10 years, but write down for yourself on a piece of paper. This is a real exercise I'm asking you to do for yourself. Write down for yourself and put this piece of paper somewhere or put it on your laptop. You can put it down. Where do you think the price of Bitcoin will be 10 years from today on the 20th anniversary? And remember this course in 10 years and look back and laugh at yourself. Right? Just, you know, we won't all know each other. Maybe there'll be a group chat. Um, but uh, what's that, Aline? You don't want to guess where it is? You don't need to share it with me. No, no. But write down and think about it. You know, where do you think this will be in 10 years? Uh, this is a hard question. Oh, just debating. Well, Alpha, do you want to share your number with the class? No, we're, we're, we're even just debating directionally. It's really going to be higher or lower. Well, how many people think it will be lower in 10 years? Okay, I'd say it's about 30, 35%. How many higher? Yeah, it's about 60, 65%. Aline, you, the two Aline split, right? 
I think it's going to be zero. <laughs> I think that would be lower. That's not what it is, because in 10 years, the system might change so dramatically, it might be unfair to even call it Bitcoin 10 years from now. Fair enough. It might have evolved into something else. Um, who was, who, on the, uh, back here, please. I just want to comment. Um, this is a real question, like, market cap, because that's what people are actually using the currency for. Because the question, like, what's the price going to be presupposes a set number of shares or coins or tokens. Sure. So the way that people are mining their coins in the future also depends on the price. So I think you raise a really good question. If you're writing something down, you could write down the market cap rather than the price. You could say, I mean, in a, in a Leeds case, you would still say zero for both. But you might say that, of course, because it depends on how many coins there are, how many shares there are. Um, does anybody want to take the other side from this, z the other Aline? I think it will have zeros in it. What's that? It will have zeros in the price. It will have zeros in the price. Hugo? Well, uh, just in response to the other comment, right? Can you know exactly how many Bitcoin there will be in about 10 years from now? Do we actually know how many Bitcoin there will be in 10 years? Yes. Yes. Yeah, Hugo says. Hugo says you do because it's written in the code. Remind me of your first name. Isaac. So I think two points. One is mining. I know that some folks may have a better technical background on mining and the way you dedicate resources based on the price, but um, I'm seeing a shake of the head, so maybe not. Uh, the other piece of it, I think, is just thinking about the flow, right? Thinking about the Bitcoin that's actually being traded or transacted. If there's a restricted market cap, it's similar to looking at big cap stocks trading in China. You know, you don't actually get a real uh, price. Uh, well, I agree with those. There's one other reason we might not know the. They could stop mining. People could stop mining. In five years, if it's zero. Oh, oh, that's if it really just dwindles out. And nobody wants to expand. But there's what's one other reason why it could be a different number than, Shimon? A fork. A fork. Right. There could be a consensus amongst 51% of the parties on, the, on this node to change the, um, what I'll call monetary policy. We've seen that twice in Ethereum. Ethereum was uh, having a certain uh, mining or block reward. They cut it in half once, or they cut it from five to three, and I think now they're going from three to two. It was not in the original Ethereum. So there could be a consensus. It's not, it's not uh, written about a lot, but it could be either what's called a fork or it could be so uh, almost unanimous that everybody went for a change in the monetary policy. All right, so that's, that's just a little bit of fun. Some other quick numbers and facts. There's 17.3 million coins right now in, in this. So 17 million coins have been uh, mined uh, so far. 550,000 blocks, roughly, um, 189 gigs. Transactions per day, a quarter of a million transactions. And then if I've got my decimals right, the hash rate is 10 to the 18th times 50. That's 7 trillion times harder than when it was in 2009. There's 7 trillion more uh, computational power in Bitcoin now than there was nine or 10 years ago. Um, it takes about a third of 1% of the world's electricity. Um, and uh, there were some nice comments uh, overnight in the, in the discussion for this class about whether that's a good thing or not. And maybe it's not a good thing. But um, so that's, that's Bitcoin anniversary. A couple other things. Um, unique addresses. There's a little bit over 500,000 unique addresses, Bitcoin addresses. Um, so if there's tens of millions of people that have Bitcoin and only half a million Bitcoin addresses, what does it mean about the probably 20 or 30 million people that f believe they own Bitcoin but don't have a Bitcoin address? Where do they own it? Uh, anyone? James? On an exchange? Yeah, on an exchange. Or in some custodial, in essence, relying on somebody else, if there's a half a million unique addresses, but it's thought there's 20 to 30 million accounts. Um, uh, 10,000 nodes. So it, uh, Bit Nodes is a website where you can see where the nodes are. Um, and it's concentration of where the actual nodes are. So um, pretty spread around. There's not any 
Alpha and Ethiopia yet. In fact, I don't see. What's that? Do you see two in Kenya? Oh, yeah, two yeah. Anybody from Greenland? No. And of course, it spurred this whole thing. We've seen this map before, but, but initial coin offerings, $28 billion roughly raised. Um, again, we don't know if the numbers are right, but this is what this 10-year anniversary or 10, 10 years since it all started. Um, this means there's a lot of capital chasing this field right now. Does anybody want to write down whether they think ICOs are still going to be around in 10 years? How many people think I, in, initial coin offerings will be around? About half. And so the other, oh, I know where Aline is, but where the rest of you? I don't actually know. I think they're going to slow down. I think in 2019 and 2020 they'll slow down because so many will have failed. There'll be more, the market will sort of adjust and say, well, we're not going to invest in these unless there's a much better business model. And so it spurred, this is just a bucket of other coins. There's 1,600 altcoins, probably 1,500 plus of them will fail or maybe all 1,600, but 1,500 plus will probably fail. Um, I might be done with, oh, yeah, crypto finance. We're, we're actually, there's not as much volatility as there once was. We, we, we're slowly getting a more stable coin. Um, it doesn't mean it will stay this way. Um, but to the extent that Bitcoin stabilizes in pricing and stabilizes for a long period, there might be a little bit more use of it. Um, but I, I wouldn't read. Six months does not make enough history to say that there's really uh, volatilities out of this thing. All right, so let's go back to payment systems. So then I'm going to ask, what are the pain points? I mean, maybe just putting up the chart tells you where the pain points are. But this was the chart we, we talked about Tuesday as to what some of the challenges are. Um, any, anybody want to give me some thoughts on this? Yeah, this was a consumer on one end and a consumer on the other end. It happens to be a US model. But it's not that different in most countries. Uh, but wh what, what pain points could blockchain help address in this uh, complex uh, uh, system. So pain points. Anybody want to give me Brodish? There are too many intermediaries in the system, which means that too many parallel ledgers. All right, so, so multiple intermediaries with parallel ledgers. What else? I guess the usual suspect would be high cost. So, so high cost, usual suspect. World Bank estimates it's between a half a percent and one percent of world GDP, which would be I guess about 400 to 800 billion dollars a year. Um, Zon? Speed of execution. Speed of execution. So what do you mean when you say speed of execution and payments? I guess the ability for a counterparty to receive the money and be able to spend it quickly. <coughs> so the final settlement, sometimes it's authorization, clearing, settlement, but final settlement uh, often doesn't occur for a couple of days. But I would add, like, for the customer perspective, uh, it just uh, occurs in three seconds. It's so, so it's a really interesting, there's a bifurcated market. From the customer's perspective, there's great speed of settlement. For the merchant side, the merchant might not have that, is what you're highlighting. Sorry. Yeah. So there are a lot of hurdles for, for the unbanked. So I, if I have never had a bank account like, mm -hmm. in the financial institution, it's very difficult for me to go through all these processes. Right. So financial inclusion. So we had cost, financial inclusion, latency, at least for the merchant side. Lots of intermediaries, as Broda said. There's a lot of ledgers that are multiple ledgers that might have some reconciliation and, and cost to them. Sure. Sean. Real-time FX settlement. Real-time FX settlement. What do you What do you mean there? So when you when you have like one kind of currency, you basically can convert the current point for the US if you have the US dollar for the, the right. Russian ruble, and then if you can uh, pledge that in one kind of cur uh, cryptocurrency, you can actually uh, use that as a unitized token. You can settle the trade tra 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 t
So I, I think I've, I'm with you. It's basically cross-border, moving, jumping from one currency, one fiat currency to another, which happens to be technically jumping from one ledger system, the US dollar ledger system. Did you say ruble? Ruble. Do they have ledgers there? Yeah, they have ledgers there. The, 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 um, you know, as a background story, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I used to attend the Financial Stability Board uh, meetings in, in Switzerland from time to time. And when Russia was going to have the next G20 meeting, I think it's now, next going to be in Argentina, but th that was the year it was going to be in Russia, the deputy governor of, of the central bank wanted to have a, a dive into issues that were in my, my area, the derivative space. So I got to know the, the, some of, something about, they do have ledgers is what I just want to say. I did know this. Um, but uh, so w what are some of the things? I heard from you, cost, delayed settlement, especially for the merchant side. I didn't hear anybody talk about chargebacks. So does anybody want to tell me about why merchants are not happy about what's called chargebacks? Or is this something more a US thing? Brodish? So we saw in the last class that out of $100, 2.75 uh, dollar was being given to different of uh, multiple intermediaries like the issuing bank and the uh, So there's a lot of cost, two and three quarters percent in the US when it's across the credit card rails. But one of the features is chargebacks. There's just a lack of finality to the transaction. So I think you talked about the example with the campaign after the campaign was over, having to having people claim the charges were fraud or whatever and having to give back runs. Right. So merchants merchants don't really have finality, Jack. Uh, but sometimes chargebacks are recourse for things that weren't actually spent. So that doesn't this kind of affect like consumers might not be as willing to enter a transaction that has that level of finality. All right. So I think uh, remind me your first name. Yeah. Dan. So Dan and Jack really have the two sides of this. From the consumer, uh, I'm sorry, Jack's the consumer side, and Dan's the merchant side. From the merchant, they want finality of settlement. They want, I've sold you a good. Uh, I was working on the campaign. We weren't selling a good, but we got a donation, and we wanted to know that 2700 was there. Or I sell a good, a cup of coffee, and it's done. But from Jack's perspective, well, I might not have gotten a good or service. I'm going to dispute it. You say that I am a, a, a monthly subscriber to the New York Times. I'm not a monthly subscriber to the New York Times. I don't want to pay the $15 a month because I'm not getting the New York Times, and it's called a chargeback. And so it's really consumers and merchants are a little bit on the different side. Um, but in the U.S., that's part of that two and three quarters percent. But merchants would probably in the U.S. at least say, uh, I'd, I'd rather not be there. And then it's whether customers are going to push back. Uh, fraud, of course. Privacy, uh, I didn't hear anybody say, but the current payment rails actually in the modern computer age gives uh, everybody along the chain a lot of information about all of us. Now, many of us don't mind it. I still want to use my Visa card. I want to use my bank account. But know that we are all giving up a little bit of our personal identity because they know how we spend. And based on those spending patterns, they can know whether we like guns or not. We're, we're, we don't like guns. And in the political space, there's people sort of look at those things or, or, or how you live your life uh, in, in many ways. And in good ways, too, because it means they can market to us what, we want to, what books we want to read and what, what uh, wines we want to drink. But it's privacy as well. Um, financial inclusion was mentioned. Raheem. Yeah, to, this, uh, to the privacy, the cyber attacks. Cyber attacks. And identity theft. So I would say this is a big pain point. So I should, good, I, I, I agree with you cyber attacks and so forth. So these, with all these pain points, the question is, will blockchain help address some of these or all of these? So then we go back to benefits of blockchain. What are the two big benefits that you keep hearing me spout about, from whether it's from Christian Catalini's paper or just Kelly? Uh, the cost of the network and then the cost of the verification. Yeah. So verification cost and networking cost. We're not going to go back through this, but it's sort of can 
lowering the verification costs address basically some of these pain points, including the cybersecurity one? And, and where does that fit together? I mean, Elon? I would add, um, does blockchain add problems? So it may solve some problems, but add other problems. And then we need to net those problems and see if uh, I'm, I'm, uh, you're ahead of me. No, no, it's good. It's good. In fact, I'm going to go. Challenges. Which problems are you going to add? Scalability. Scalability. What other problems? Uh, Brodish, I've heard from over here. Uh, high transaction costs. Tra high transaction costs on and, and it's kind of blockchain. It takes some days to process the transaction. It's slow. So it's slow. So scalability slow. It might be high transaction cost, Alexis. And interoperability. Interoperability. So it's all our friends, Stephanie. There's also the issue of error resolution. Error resolution, good one. Now, like when consumers are like trying to fix something wrong with like you know fraudulent <clears throat> part transaction or something, like with blockchain, if it's immutable, you can't do that. Right. So it's this trade-off. It's a little bit like what Jack was saying about chargebacks. From the customer side, there might be an actual error. It's a different type of error, but an error. And I want to be able to say, I'm not taking the New York Times any longer. I'm sorry to the New York Times. I'm just picking. But you're saying there could be true error. Shimon, did you? Uh, have isn't like the, the core system where we have like this, this delays and it's not really technological, but it's sort of it's a business issue in the sense that finality, instant finality, opens up a lot of exposure for fraud, for, you know. So the current level of fraud that we see will probably go up a lot if, if someone could, you know, game the system, get their cash out at the, at the same time, right? It'd be very hard to, it'd be very hard to trace it back. So Shimon's raising, maybe we don't have, we have, maybe we have delayed settlement. Maybe we don't have immediate finality because as a market feature, we kind of want some delayed settlement to protect against fraud, to make sure that uh, there's not errors, as Stephanie says. Maybe there's a delay for business reasons. Um, but uh, Kelly, you no, anybody want to take the other side? I want somebody to take the other side. This Aline. I mean, I'm biased. I'll, I'll admit it. But I, I think that basically that says, let, let's have a inferior system out there because it's good. And it's like, yeah, I mean, I think to some extent, you do want, there are benefits to kind of having a delayed settlement, but there are also a lot of benefits of having finality. So why not have both? You know, you don't need to just kind of have an inferior settlement kind of system out there and say, okay, this is a standard. You can also bring another, you know, another solution right beside it that actually offers finality for people who want it. All right, so if everybody remembers, Aline works at the Digital Currency Initiative, used to work in payments. He's admitting he might have a little bit of a bias, but he's saying, Fine, you want some delayed settlement, but shouldn't we have an alternative? Because not every market will want delayed settlement. Eric. Yeah, but uh, just wanted to tie these two points of view to another challenge, which is uh, issues on the handling of governance. Because in the case of Ethereum, for example, there's a little bit of more elaborate governance of the distributed arrangement of the blockchain. That um, decision between going uh, from uh, um, supposedly uh, theft cause a, a, a fork. So handling a centralized um, arrangement is much easier than a blockchain which is a totally distributed right, right. Uh, So please, John. Another uh, challenge is the government regulation on the anti-money laundry and the... Uh, right. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, uh, uh, Kelly? I'm not sure if this sort of ties into the finality of it, but um, one of the articles talked a little bit about the fact that there's an issue with managing liquidity, given the speed of the transactions, especially at the corporate level, where the value of the transactions are much higher. There's a bit of an opportunity cost trade-off there. Right. So uh, we're going to chat about that in a minute, about the, the liquidity in particularly using a cryptocurrency. Uh, as a bridge between two fiat currencies, but it has to, somewhat to do with the volatility of cryptocurrencies. Um, but I would say to this point about, uh, I'm coming back to Aline versus Dan. 
um, or with Shimon, really, I, I'm sorry, different debate. Um, I, th I think that this new technology is coming along at a time where we can shorten settlement. And a lot of the delayed settlement in payments, in, the, in Wall Street, in securities, we used to have that you would do equity trades transaction day plus five days before any of us, before I was born to, a long time ago. Then it went to transaction day plus three. And in Europe, they went to transaction plus two days, two days for settlement of securities trades, somewhere 10 or 15 years ago. And the US caught up. The US was behind and just went to transaction plus two days. Um, but I think technology could be T plus zero in securities. And in payments, you could go to real time payments. The US Federal Reserve had a big um, process where they got public comment. Uh, and, they, and, and, and they're moving towards what's called real time uh, payments by 2020. Now, maybe it will be adopted in 2021 because it will take longer to roll out. But I, I think the technology to, uh, does provide that it will be more um, options. And in some cases, the markets will stay with delayed settlement because it's just history. It's just legacy. And other times, it will stay with delayed settlement because they actually prefer it. I think in the securities world, some people actually prefer delayed settlement. We'll talk about this in a few lectures, but they prefer it because it allows shorting of securities. When you actually borrow somebody else's security and sell it, you usually sell it before you borrow it. And so the shorting, the, the whole parts of our capital markets that are built around delayed settlement, because you usually sell, borrow, and settle, <laughs> rather than borrow, sell, and settle. So if you put securities lending on a blockchain, then, and you were able to immediately point to the borrow that you get and trace that back, wouldn't you then have securities lending on a T0, and you could short on T0 and know exactly what security you put you borrowed? I think that it is technically feasible to move stock borrow to, to, um, onto a blockchain. I'm agreeing with that. But the question is whether the economics of that market, whether the market participants want to actually arrange the borrow before they sell, because currently they sell before they arrange the borrow. But they have to get the locate on that same day, right? Well, when it's T plus two, uh, depending upon, uh, I'm sorry, I'm speaking finance here, but maybe you'll help me. Well, I, um, we had to get, I used to be in sales and trading. We had to get a borrow, like a reference number before someone shorted something. So they couldn't short. I don't know if it's changed. So I, don't, I don't know. Like it's no, no, it might be that I'm the, I'm the old seasoned dog that was, now that you're saying they're tighter, yeah, so but. They, I wanted to, to short something, they would call me, and then I'd have to call the market maker, uh, get a borrow, put in a reference number, and they would carve off that amount, whatever they wanted to borrow, so it wasn't available for anyone else. And then they sold it. So it was right. like, but, it was done on a ledger, but yeah. So, so the market may already be moving towards it. So I work on the securities lending desk that he used to call. That's, that's what I'm saying. And, <laughs> and, go. and that one came into effect after 2008 with the no naked short selling. And so then you had to get the locate on T0 on the same exact day that you borrowed. But you didn't actually need to borrow the stocks until T3. You just had to have the locate. Yeah. You just need to have a locate so you on it. Double, like, mine. But I guess my question was, if you moved that securities lending transaction to a blockchain, you could immediately borrow it and be able to trace that. And then when it came to get recall. So, so for those of you that are not as close to the world of finance and stock loan and stock borrow, um, the point of the discussion is, is that <clears throat> markets have evolved, built upon delayed settlement. And the delayed settlement may well have been because they all evolved from paper, not computer days. So we had authorization, clearing, settling in the payment world. But in stock borrow, you have to actually locate a security to sell. Um, it sounds like there's some market evolution post 2008 that you actually had to add a, an identifier, though you didn't have to borrow. My point is, is that um, all of this can be put on a blockchain, but there's also economic market realities as to whether somebody wants to. 
And I think, let's see, if you're Dan, you don't want chargebacks, but Jack still wants them. And in the delayed settlement, Shimon wants to keep his delayed settlement, and Aline wants to go the other way. And I suspect that in some markets, um, uh, uh, let's go with Dan and Aline are together, that finality will be important. And what blockchain allows, it allows for the economics of finality to be uh, a fair debate, in a sense, a level. Whereas in the past, you couldn't even have the debate because it was so paper intensive. That, that's where. So blockchain changes that economics. Let me go back a slide and just say why, maybe, maybe why is blockchain, what, what, what are the possible suitability of, of uh, payments to the blockchain technology world? And, and these were some that I threw up. Payment systems use ledgers. Geez, all right, that's the sweet spot. They, they use ledgers. In fact, that's what Satoshi Nakamoto started this whole thing on. Multiple parties certainly want to read. And in a lot of circumstances, multiple parties want to write to the ledger, like actually record to the ledger. Um, so it's kind of right in the middle of this. You might be able to lower verification costs, but more importantly, verification costs are really critical to the economics of payment. That, that, that you, you, you're, you have the money that you say you have or the value. You're sending it to this account, not that account. Um, so in a sense, I look at this and I go, this feels like fertile ground. Um, fertile ground that hasn't yet been plowed because 10 years, 10 year anniversary or birthday, um, uh, it, it's, um, we're still not there. Um, but any other thoughts? I mean, micropayments is another, but Aline, you're the expert. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the one thing that I think it's exciting to some of the folks of, in the DCI, myself included, is the fact that they can attach code to these movements of, uh, of value. So you can start program these, these uh, chunks of money. And are you saying attach code to identify that it's Kelly's payment or it's James's payment? Or are you saying identify code in the form of smart contracts? I mean, basically, smart contract, right? Uh, you just say, hey, you know what? I'm going to release the funds if, uh, you know, if, if uh, this individual signs and this individual signs at the same time. And then you get the money, right? And that adds an additional layer of, uh, of complexity that traditional payments of the Visa MasterCard variety don't have, right? So you, you get a whole new layer, for lack of a better word, of, of possibilities. When you start adding, okay, well, okay, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to give you something if it's, uh, if it's sunny outside. Okay, we can make that happen in real time. We didn't have a real. We need some cost, and I mean, with the visas and whatnot. You're gonna so, say it a little louder, just so we. I mean, I, I, I get his point, yes, but I mean, it will eliminate the trust issue, which is with the visa. I am not sure I get why. The cost and the transaction movement and the validation. Wouldn't that be eliminated? Yes, you have a smart contract. It's adding a layer, but on the other hand, it's eliminating some layers from the other process as well. Yeah, no, no. So assuming, so, 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 yeah, so the onus is on, on, on the technologies that build this, make sure that you don't lose functionality that you have in a visa world, because otherwise nobody would use this, this whole new way of doing payments. Mm -hmm. So it's assumed that you maintain parity of what the technology offers, and then add additional functionality. Um, I'm going to say I'm pretty relaxed about the open laptops. I get less relaxed about people texting during class. And, and I know that we're all multitaskers, but I'm just, I'm, I'm like the most relaxed you can imagine, but I'm starting to get a little on my edge here. Tom. So I get that blockchain allows for smart contracts, and it's obviously a, a much more brute force system. But we talk about like attaching code so the payments are automated. I think of like, I set up an automatic payment of my cable bill every and so it's like, as soon as that, that payment comes to me, I pre-authorize it to go through. And so why can't you, in a non-blockchain setting, establish basically a smart contract that's got some more? A conditional, a conditional payment. Right. So do you have to have a blockchain to have a smart contract? So you know, one, one, sorry, if I can respond to that, right? One of the coolest use cases that I've heard and I'm not going to name any entities, but you know, this blockchain-based, let's say, company, for lack of a better word, 
uh, who wants to pay their employees, and I said, look, you join me here now. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna make a smart contract that basically is gonna pay you for your services for the next three years. Period. That's it. There's no additional at such and such frequency, right? And and we sign a contract now, and that's it. You're gonna get paid, right? And then you start working, and you, know, you actually have a very insured way that I will get paid, and nobody can stop it, right? Uh, today, you don't have that, right? There are many things that could happen. You know, managing happens. You know, whatever happens, I can find a way to kind of get around all of that, right? That's kind of useful to kind of make sure that hey, I'm going to get paid regardless. That's useful. Right? So, but, that, but you have to then put aside. Yeah, exactly. Like if I am your employer, I have to put that three years worth of salary into a lockbox, and I can't do anything yeah, with it for those three. You have to escrow it three years forward. It's a limitation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, but but I'm not saying look. There, all of this is limitation. It's not like you suddenly have free money. It's all good for everyone, right? right. But there are useful things that show up. Useful things that we never thought about. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, all I'm saying is that there are a lot of possibilities. And I don't know the right use case for it. And I, you know, it's just an example that I thought, like, oh, that's pretty cool. I could use this. Uh, but you know, you're right. I mean, there are many implications. But just the very fact that you have a whole new area to explore, to me, that's exciting. Like, we've seen what the system does. We've seen it, right? You know, like, we've, we've bagged 90% of the people. If you're in the 10%, it's kind of sucky. But for the 90%, it kind of works, right? You know, you, you have T plus two. It's awesome, right? But like. We've hit the ceiling of what we can do with this system. Maybe there's an additional approach. Let's see what happens there. I invited Aline because we needed a little bit more maximalism in the room. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, James. But, but going back to the, the point earlier, it's, do we really need blockchain to do a lot of the stuff the smart contracts promise to do? I, I mean, I set up my, in the UK, I set up a direct debit. That happens. That just disappears from my account at a certain time period. Does it involve blockchain? I can see some benefits of blockchain, but again, a lot of the smart contracts, can we not already use existing so, system, make those systems better? Yeah, and right, this right. goes back to the whole payment system. There are a lot of players in the field that hasn't been invented, that hadn't been innovating for the last 20 years, what we read, mm -hmm. but can they not make existing systems so much better without the use of blockchain? So the question is, is do you really need blockchain or is it just going to be a catalyst for sort of the legacy systems to kind of do what they otherwise technologically could have done, but it's a kind of sharp kick in the, in the, in the backside to kind of do, do a little bit better? Uh, that, that, that's a really good point, right? That's something that we debate a lot about. And, and it actually is, as we sit now, it's absolutely possible that this would be the way, right? So one example that shows up frequently is BitTorrent. So BitTorrent, for those of you who don't know, it's a way in which you share video online and nobody, you know, it, it has a lot of problems with it, but it catalyzed and changed the entire, you know, distribution of media, right? It, it was, you know, it has a lot of problems, so it didn't work out the way it, folks thought it would, but it still kind of changed the whole industry. And it's absolutely possible that blockchains will do, will take that path. It's unclear now, but it's absolutely possible that will take So blockchain could be just a catalyst like BitTorrent was, and then all of a sudden at the end of the day we got... Apple, uh, what do they call it? Uh, yeah. Apple Store, thank you. But, um, Zan, were you trying to? Yeah. yeah, well, I was just going to build on that. I think that's our, I've already seen that happening. Like, I was looking into Swift recently, and uh, I think after blockchain in the past few years, they launched the uh, Global Payments Innovation Initiative, which seems like, all right, we recognize that our infrastructure is legacy, and we need to do something to kind of keep current. And they've spent and invested a ton of money in like unifying standards across the messaging platform and making it much easier to use. So not a blockchain solution, but has certainly been an advantage. Right. So it's been a catalyst for Swift. Ripple has been a catalyst for Swift that we're going to yeah. talk about in a minute. Uh, but others have been as well. But I still would challenge the group, and it's sort of what we're all trying to do here. Are there still opportunities that an append-only log, that you're you're, you're uh, appending, you're adding information to the, the registry or the ledger. You're not deleting it. Well, this is going to be good. And you need a consensus of multiple parties writing to the ledger. Uh, a special guest. Hi, Shri. Many of you know me. Shri, many people might know, uh, is uh, Priya's significant other husband, I think. But that's not why he's here. He's not here. He's here as a payment expert. Oh, that's the reason why. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you are a payment. You would, you want to introduce? Well, I'm not an expert. I work for Mastercard. 
Uh, and uh, I happen to be Priya's husband as well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we've been in this industry for a uh, few years. Priceless. Price? Priceless. 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 Priceless, exactly. We're still running that. Uh, so you're at MasterCard Payments, and give us your, your thoughts on this. So I'm actually in the opposite camp uh, from this blockchain and cryptocurrency for a few reasons. So you're in the minimalist camp. Do you call it minimalist? <laughs> I, uh, I believe that you can do everything that blockchain promises it does using the current systems we have. Uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. Number one is crypto is expensive and it's for transaction. You can always secure transactions in systems we have today using technologies that exist. So you don't need to have a Bitcoin or a blockchain as an example. Um, the irrevocability that we're talking about when it comes to Bitcoin and the other uh, kind of advantages about distributed ledgers, everything can be accomplished through the systems we have today. They just don't choose to do it because it's expensive. And it will be expensive when you scale blockchain to the millions of people and in, you know, other industries we have. It will become expensive there as well. Um, the, um, so, the two main things that, that are important in payment systems are acceptance and scale. Simple. If you achieve the acceptance and scale uh, through blockchain, sure, that'll work and everybody will be using blockchains and bitcoins and it'll, it'll all work. The problem is it's taken us 40 years to achieve acceptance and scale with Visa and MasterCard and the acquirers and the issuers and this whole ecosystem. It's taken a long time and it's working. And if you want to replace that with this new system and achieve the same level of acceptance and scale, think about how big of an effort that is. It's almost impossible. And the amount of dollars you have to spend on that, why? Okay. Right? So uh, I see if a few people want to take, Hugo, are you going to take the other side? Uh, I can start. Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and, then, and then we're going to move on. But I just I want to hear the other side. Cause, and, and I thank you for being willing to to speak up, because it's really helpful. And, and I don't know your role at Master Accord, but it's just, Product. what's that? Product management. Product management. But you're speaking for yourself personally or MasterCard? <laughs> MasterCard is doubling with blockchain as well, so I'm <laughs> speaking for it personally. Yeah, because yeah. MasterCard actually filed a, a patent with the US Patent Office for crypto fractional banking. Yeah. And, and Bank of America has 43 patents. In the, in the crypto space. And Visa is filed for patents in the board. So you have Visa, Bank of America, uh, MasterCard, and others filing for patents on blockchain, fractional banking, payments, and so forth. So it's sort of an interesting side. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll get this established. Professor Lessig. But just one qualification on this. It kind, of, it kind of depends on who you are right now. I mean, because you know, this is all true as a description of banking in the developed world. But to the extent you're talking about these transactions outside of the developed world, then the, the coefficients on these variables changes significantly. So if you have no reliable legal infrastructure, um, then the blockchain technology becomes a real plus relative to a world where you have a very reliable infrastructure, which is obviously the developed world. So what, what Larry shared with us is, well, there's a lot of different countries, 180. There's 1.7 billion people still not banked in the world, half of sub-Saharan Africa, for instance. So, you know, there's still a, a challenge there. I'm sorry, Hugo, we... I, I was going to say something similar. It, it, that, like, I appreciate the argument, but it kind of sounds like it's not broken, don't fix it. Like, we've spent so much money building the system. So, you know, it works now, but, like, let's, let's not look at what technological innovation can... Oh, no, no, no that's not what I meant. What, what I meant was, if it's not if it's not broken, don't fix it. We have achieved so much in the payments world over the past 40 years. Improve it while maintaining the, 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 the goodness of the infrastructure that exists today. Instead of blockchain, it's just a rip and replace sure. whole thing, which, which doesn't solve a purpose. Sure. I, yeah, I don't think that blockchain is the like, one-stop shop for everything. Like, I, I'm more on like the Bitcoin maximalist side where I think like 
Sure, if you have like a, a global currency where you can go anywhere and, and use it and it's, uh, you know, it, it's self-sovereign and you can do all that, that would be great. I know like MasterCard and Visa have a, a, an interest in saying like, well, we've spent so much money, like you can use MasterCard and Visa most places in the world, but like what happens if you go into like <coughs> the middle of, I don't know, some village in India or, or sub-Saharan Africa or wherever, and they don't take a credit card, but they have a cell phone with a Bitcoin wallet, like I can still transact there and, yeah. You can transact uh, with the uh, fiat currency also. Right, no, I, I, but then they have to go through the process of changing banking. that and banking. banking. Right. So, right. so let's, let's uh, take British and then we'll, we'll kind of, this is a good debate, by the way. Just the discussion came to India, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, so we have our expert now. No, so, so there's a, like, could be a third solution as well. So uh, we have uh, gone through in the, in the readings of the last class as well about the United Payment Interface in India, which is not a blockchain solution. Uh, so uh, the government of India has actually promoted something, a new entity called a payment bank which is like a low frills, no service kind of bank to uh, in, uh, promote financial inclusion. And based on that, just using a unique identification number and just a mobile device, you can make any sort of payments of any denomination. It can be like, like a very, very low uh, local currency as well. And you can do all of that at real time basis uh, without any of these intermediaries. And those are low cost transactions without leveraging on the blockchain technology. Yeah. <coughs> Do you need an other card? You need an other card, which is like more than, it's like nine, more than 95% uh, coverage in the country. What's the name of the card? Uh, just that you need yeah. some form of identification. Identification. Oh, India's really been at the cutting edge in the last, I'll say, two to three years, uh, partly because they could leapfrog some of the card rails. There was not broad adoption or access, as Shreem has talked about in India, for credit cards. And so similar to what we saw in Kenya, and we talked about on Tuesday and in China, where, where companies, private sector, leapfrogged. In India, it was more if I believe it was the government sector rather than the private sector said, we want to bring a great many of the population into a system. So they created an ID, a unique ID system. I can't remember the name of each of these. That's the, that's the card. Uh, uh, they created uh, a payments uh, IMSP, if I have the right. IMSP was the older one, now it's UPI, it's United right. so Payment Interface. But a payment system, which is not 270 basis points, but probably is measured in single to low double digit basis points. Um, uh, your, your actual pay, everybody in India, uh, the, their, your, your employment, uh, goes into this, and there's biometrics as well to the ID system. Um, now, there might be cybersecurity risks that this is all then in sense somewhat centralized, but India sort of leapfrogged. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, but we've had a lively debate. Is finality something we want or not? Is chargeback something we want or not? Can you do this all without blockchain, or is blockchain something that's needed? And of course, the question, even if blockchain's really kind of neat and good, will it just get the incumbents to uh, move, move a little bit more into innovation and lowering their cost? Do you want to close this one out? I think we, yeah, we may add something else. It's censorship resistant. Mm -hmm. So you can, everyone can be uh, exchanging Bitcoins uh, without any government forbidding it. Right. That's another thing. Now, it's an interesting thing. You know, if it's censorship resistant to you must extend me credit, and you can't d decide on whether I get credit based on my race or religion or ethnicity and, and so forth. Th that's probably something a broad group of people would say, that's pretty good. But if it's censorship resistant to being like, you can drug traffic, society might say, well, that's not what we want. So it's an interesting set of, uh, you know, when the technology allows you to be censorship resistant, but society says, well, there's still some social cohesion about drug trafficking or, or child uh, labor or, you know, so, and I'm using the ones that are, you know, easy to hold on to. So it's a little interesting debate. Yes. Um, 
I think so. When we were speaking about the develop, uh, the underdeveloped and developing uh, part of uh, part of economy and payments and blockchain. Professor Lessig. Uh, yes, and I, and I think one thing that we haven't addressed is the last mile, which is liquidity. And so, even if blockchain addresses, let's say, the accountability or the transfer, what it doesn't address is the actual liquidity and utilization in the last mile on the ground, which is very essential to a developing economy. Right. I'm sorry, remind me of Aviva. So Aviva, are you saying last mile, like that, that somebody could actually use this cryptocurrency in a store yes. to buy their grains or their goods for the week right. to exactly. keep their family? Yeah, yeah, so that doesn't solve the problem of, of adoption and, lots, you know, and scalability. Right, right. Oh. Fiat money, and before we had paper money, we had coins and everything. Money is a social construct. We've talked about that. And beyond its advantages that it's used for taxes, and it's good for all debts, public and private, in most countries, it, it really is exactly what Aviva said, that society at large says, I will use this as a unit of account. That uh, whether it's my employment or the, or the milled goods I'm buying to feed my family, uh, it's this unit of account that over hundreds of years people adopt until they don't. I don't know how long in Venezuela they'll keep using their currency as a, as a unit of account. So sometimes there's last mile problems even with fiat currency. But I, 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 I not only hear you, I share your, your thoughts, you know, that where, where's the, the adoption um, in the last mile, if you well said. Um, so uh, just what are some of the, we talked about the challenges, um, what are some companies? Well, there's in crypto, and I just, I'm listing two or three, but if you wanted to talk about others, I just listed in crypto, there's startups. BitPay is one of the most popular ones where it was basically saying to merchants, if you want to take Bitcoin, we'll convert your Bitcoin for you to fiat. And that's, in essence, what they're doing. So I'm going to take it back to the Hillary campaign. We had some donors that wanted to give us Bitcoin. You know, we're a merchant, in a sense, but we also wanted to elect a president. And those donors might want to give us Bitcoin. So uh, uh, one of my colleagues uh, um, uh, had to investigate, could we take Bitcoin? And, and what did it mean under f federal election law and things like that? And we looked at whether to hire. BitPay uh, or somebody like that and so forth. We chose not to because we didn't think there was enough donors who really wanted to give us enough Bitcoin. And we didn't think we would freshen up Hillary's image because we were going to announce she's the Bitcoin candidate or something. Tom, did we miss it? Is this? Could have won Wisconsin with that. We could have won Wisconsin with that. Uh, OK. I'm going to be apologizing until my grave for that election, but this is, this is it, right? Uh, but it's a real story. Uh, one of my colleagues investigated it. I'm not trying to throw him under the bus or anything, but it was just like, oh my gosh, the amount of time we would have to spend with Perkins Coie, the law firm, and what we would have to pay to kind of think this through. And um, we can only take $2,700. So you know, you, you'd have to, every day it would be a different number of Bitcoin. It could not be more than $2,700 because there was no way that we were going to break the election laws. Um, so ultimately, we sort of, it, the project went away. And the reason I share that story is for a lot of merchants right now, maybe as Aviva said in the last mile, the merchants are saying, I'm not sure I need to do this, but there's a way to do it. If you, anybody in this room starts a company and you say, I want to take crypto, there are companies out there that will uh, provide you that interface. And their fees, does anybody know BitPay's fees? It wasn't part of the readings, but uh, other than Aline. All right, Aline. One percent. So if you are a merchant, Starbucks, the Hillary campaign, <laughs> if you're a merchant and you say, I want to have less than 2.7%, I can have 1% fees. I want finality and I don't want chargebacks, depending upon which side of this you're on. They're trying to just do it as a lower cost solution. 
one percent. Priya. A similar story, but maybe with a happier ending. So a lot of happier than not winning the election. <laughs> All right. um, so for a lot of philanthropic organizations, this is becoming a very real issue. So the Silicon Valley Community Foundation reported a 30% increase in its endowment due to digital assets donations. And uh, there, it's happening in a few community foundations as well. It's a growing field of interest. And there's even a story, of, I mean, a, not a story, it really happened of uh, one of the exchanges doing this service, converting the digital donations into um, you know, fiat currency, and it crashed because the volume was just so much. They could not, uh, even like the trickle, they could not keep up. But this is becoming yeah. a real thing now. And, and whether, whether it's a large foundation or a political campaign, there's also a little bit of reputational risk because you want to make sure that the, the funds are not illicit funds. I mean, it just so there's a little bit of a reputational risk that maybe a Starbucks wouldn't have when you're just buying a cup of coffee. I mean, I, I'm not, I've never run a Starbucks, but. Um, so, so the crypto exchanges and BitPay sort of provide a lot of services. E-wallet uh, companies provide services. Sean. I'm just curious, how does BitPay manage volatility? How does it cash out? How does it manage volatility? Exactly. Uh, so it only takes a 1% cut of the transacted value, but the volatility of which can um, go over 1% like in, in a couple of seconds. So in that case, how do they manage? So they are, they are arranged basically uh, uh, with a number of crypto exchanges. I, I, I once knew, but I don't know whether they have arrangements with three or five or whatever. And they basically are pricing right at the, so they have sort of close to real time pricing. So I'm going to buy a cup of coffee. The way the technology works, and let's say it's, uh, what's a Starbucks cup of coffee? It's $5? Pretty expensive, isn't it? Depending on what you buy. What's your cup of coffee? <laughs> Two twenty-five. Two twenty-five. All right, but in real time, the app, the BitPay app, is computing what that is, and they feel that that within the seconds for them to convert out, they take some, they take volatility risk. Is it possible that they, in some transactions, earn? Um, uh, the volatility eats up the whole one percent. Yes, but but they basically pr they have that in their pricing model, uh, and then move basically pre is Bitcoin to dollars, and the dollars goes to Starbucks, and they guarantee Starbucks you know two twenty five minus one percent. So. Um, then uh, there's, there's startups actually uh, getting in. Um, but most of these, at least the second, third, and fourth, are kind of institutional services. Now, there might be retail services that I'm not. Quorum was started by JP Morgan. I think it might even still be owned by JP Morgan. It was going to be spun out. But R3, Ripple, these are really institutional, almost B2B or financial firm to financial firm uh, right now. Um, there's, uh, I couldn't find a really good startup in the retail space. But two weeks from today, <laughs> you're going to have <coughs> Jeff Sprecher and Kelly here. And you can, Shreem, are you going to be back on November 15th? No? But you'll be able to challenge. Well, what, what, what can, what, they're going to have a retail payment system uh, in their Bitcoin. So it'll be interesting. Um, one retail payment solution is if anybody walks over to building E14, there's a vending machine in the media lab right now that takes Bitcoin. Thank you, MIT. Thank you, the Digital Currency Initiative. Thank you, Aline. <laughs> but there is literally, uh, you, you uh, do you want to describe it? Do you put a QR code up? Yeah, I mean, we, so uh, yes, absolutely. So anyone who wants to do that, we can, we can walk over there and, and look at it. It has cross-chain swaps, so you can transact real time between Three different currencies, and so you can uh, take Bitcoin, Litecoins, and uh, uh, you know, dummy US dollars we call it. But it's you know, it's a basically a, it's a stable coin. It's a stable, a stable coin. coin. So you Bitcoin, Litecoin, and a stable coin. And there's a vending machine sitting in the media lab. You put a QR code up, if I remember. Um, yeah, so the QR code on the machine. 
you scan, we published an app uh, on uh, Android and iOS, and you basically you know, you scan your home node or your computer, you allow your phone to control your computer, and then you can send money from your phone to your vending machine. Real time. But in that case, the vending machine receives the Bitcoin. No, no, so we actually added a, a, a Arduino as well that uh, converts the Bitcoin into impulses that trick the machine to say, these are coins. So the vending machine actually gets, you know, we, we turn it how many. Yeah. There you go. Um, uh, check it out over in the Media Lab. It was rolled out for Media Lab Members Week, actually, two weeks ago. So, um, and, uh, and then there's incumbents, ISIS startup backed. I do put MasterCard on their stream. I do, like, you know, but, but you all, it's remarkable how many patents are being filed. Hundreds of patents are being filed, but they're almost all by the incumbents. Now, is that because they want to block others from getting in? Are they trying to create barriers to entry? Or are they doing it because they see real prospect and opportunity and they want to pursue it? It's probably a bit of both. Uh, Larry, you're shaking your head. It's all barriers to entry. It's all barriers. And you don't think it's any? No, it's all barriers to entry. And then the argument's like this. Our system's great. And guess what? The legal cost of pursuing your system is going to be through the roof. So. And we'll get some patents along the way. No, those patents are the legal yeah. cost. That's yeah. the point. The threat of the patent litigation is enough to stop any. So if you're a, if you're a venture capitalist and they walk in like the night before your announcement, um, you're dead. Yeah. Well, Bank of America has 43, so in the blockchain space, I read. Strategy in every major incumbent context, um, you know, so there's nothing new here. Yeah. So is it a sign that there's something really real here, <coughs> that the startups might have something, you know, to be uh, figured out? Visa started a business-to-business -business, uh, payment connect in 2016. Uh, they've even announced, Visa's even announced, it hasn't had a lot of adoption. They're not sure. Uh, I think it's more permission than permissionless, by the way. Uh, but th this is kind of, now is anybody in their own readings, maybe a lean? I mean, I'm not trying to be exhaustive, but there's not a lot of, because of some of these issues back here, these, these are real challenges. But I would say these are real possibilities, too. Uh, Kelly and then Aline. What about some of the companies that sort of backed out? Like, in our reading, Strike ended their uh, like exploratory, exploratory program, um, like it sounds like a pretty defeated situation, mm -hmm. but I don't really understand that much exactly why. But uh, uh, do you want to answer the Stripe question? Yes, I mean Stripe is not Bitcoin. Stripe wanted to maybe use Bitcoin as a service. I mean, they're clients; they're not the startup. So I, I think backing up is it, it makes sense because they're clients. But there's, uh, there's many startups out there that are still here, not the key. Yeah, and just as background, Stripe is a payment system provider. So they're, neither, they're not extending credit like a Visa or MasterCard, or they're not a network like Visa and MasterCard, who are actually, they don't provide the credit the banks do. But um, they, they are a payment system provider that merchants would hire Stripe to interface with MasterCard, Discover, American Express, and others. Um, but why did Stripe decide not to continue on this? Partly, they didn't see a lot of adoption, is what I took. But Aline, you were going to answer? Uh, yeah, just a couple of, couple of things I wanted. So this is a great list. I think it's a great starting point. Uh, and uh, the, the rule that I think at some point three months ago I had was uh, in the cryptocurrency space, uh, most non-speculation money, so not like I'm going to buy low, sell high, is coming from either exchanges or miners. Uh, so the, you know, exchanges you got exchanges or miners. Yes. So that's where the money is made. If you don't speculate, you either a miner and you make money, or an exchange and make money. Uh, the miner that I think would be interesting, I think I, I would put uh, Bitmain over there because I think it's Bitmain. Bitmain. So Bitmain, for those who don't know, uh, is going through an ICO, uh, an, an initial uh, sorry IPO, initial uh, uh, the, 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 the good traditional, old way. Traditional. Yep. 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 yep, yep. Uh, they, uh, you know, they, they have a lot of money. They're going to be valued at a you know, very hefty rate. Uh, they want to start producing uh, AI chips, uh, you know, artificial intelligence chips, right? So they're very good at producing chips, uh, and they will go. You know, they're going to one of those. But is Bitmain in the payment 
space using blockchain for payments. I mean, they, they, they've invested in a circle, which is another exchange. So, you know, they're like, I mean, they have a lot of money. They're trying to kind of place it towards other companies. So, uh, yeah, so exchanges of the Binance or all these other folks, like, there are a lot of exchanges that make money. And the other ones are. So I want to talk a little bit about cross-border. On Tuesday, we put up a complex chart. I don't need to go through that again. But we all know, and there's a lot of people here that probably send money back. When you're moving something overseas, you're moving from one fiat to another fiat currency. It takes some time. And the banking system over centuries has formed a way to do that, to move from one money to another, or as we say, one ledger system to another ledger system through correspondent banking. And correspondent banking is, is a reasonably concentrated uh, business. Uh, one student sent uh, in the group chat uh, last night that there's only really 10 banks in this field. I don't know if that's accurate, by the way. But it is a very concentrated business because they're large international banks. Whether it's 10 or 20, it's, you know, and they can charge a little excess. Uh, because they have to have correspondence. They have to have relationships with all the local banks. And they're taking some credit risk, the correspondent banks standing in between, some credit risk of the local banks on, on both sides, in the US and so forth, and in, the let's say, Mexico, if it's between the US and Mexico. So one idea that's been uh, around, uh, it's, it's widely associated with Ripple, but it's not only associated with Ripple, is this simple chart. What if I move fiat to crypto and crypto to fiat? Is this called a bridge crypto or bridge currency? I can sort of say I can go from US dollars to Bitcoin or XRP. You, you, you fill in the middle and then move over to the other fiat, uh, Mexican peso in my example. Um, and might that? take some cost out of the system. We have Sean's issue earlier of volatility. If the crypto is fluctuating a lot, that, that causes some issues. If there's a lot of cost or friction, because now you're doing two currency exchanges, not one. I'm calling crypto a currency for this purpose. I know that crypto is not technically a currency. Uh, but, but for this moment, let, let me just call it, you have two currency exchanges. And thus, you have uh, two bid-ask spreads to pay. Just the market makers, you need to pay the bid-ask spreads twice. And you have some volatility if the middle crypto is moving around. But this simple diagram is a big part of what Ripple is trying to create with X Rapid, right? X X Current is a messaging app of Ripple's, and it's competing with Swift. And, and, and it has some reasonable adoption. A lot of banks are starting to use it. But don't confuse that <laughs> with another product, which is an interesting product that kind of does this, that goes fiat to crypto, crypto to fiat. So what problem, what pain points would this be solving if it worked in, in the um, cross-border? Anybody want to remind the class what the, Tom? Well, this reduces the number of intermediaries. You don't have to have your bank engage with a correspondence bank, which engages with a local bank, which then it, it, it sort of. All right, so it might. I'm going to say it might lower the intermediation uh, because you still have on the two fiat sides to a bank, a local bank and a bank. And to do the crosses, you need some market making function which in Ripple's case, they try to build into the application. And they have market makers to provide liquidity. There was a question, somebody mentioned liquidity, some liquidity. But it might lower the numbers of intermediaries. What else might it do? And there's usually between um, exchanging currencies, there's a balance between like the settlement time and like the fee that you pay. So if you want quick settlement, you have to pay a higher fee. Um, or you can accept like a lower fee, but it takes multiple days sometimes to change over. So potentially it could solve that. So this is basically a way that you can shorten the settlement times. This can be done literally in seconds. I'm not saying that you wouldn't pay a little extra for it, but this can be done very quickly if you have arrangements. So some contend, and I've spoken to them at conferences and so forth, that 
big corporate treasuries are going to try to do this, that the treasury function of Apple and others might take this up. The big banks say that's ridiculous. The big banks say, no, we can provide real-time cross-border cash movement between dollar and euro and dollar and yen, and you don't need to interpose something in the middle. Wouldn't that require huge amounts of, of cash reserves to be able to protect against volatility and not only the volatility of the crypto, but the volatility of the actual fiat for that particular country? <coughs> uh, so the question is, will it need a lot of liquidity, basically? You used a different word, maybe, but reserves. reserves. But somebody who can make markets of, in size in crypto versus fiat and crypto versus fiat, I think the answer is yes in terms of the only, the, only, the only probably token right now that has enough liquidity in it to do this in size is probably Bitcoin. Even though Ripple is promoting this and it's, a, it, it's sort of an interesting technology. They have a software, XRapid, that you can do this right now. Um, uh, they're promoting on XRP. Uh, but is there enough liquidity? Could you move more than a million dollars? Probably not. You probably couldn't move a hundred million dollar payment without moving the market a lot. Shimon. So, back to finance. I mean, the only way to so back to work. finance. It's good from a finance professor. The only way work is, is sort of subject to the cost of arbitraging this, right? Mm -hmm. You don't care about the, the value of XRP, provided that you're not validating arbitrage relationships between the two. <coughs> Uh, fiat, right? That's so correct. If, if there, so whatever those frictions are, you won't be able to go underneath them. And and if you're Apple, I guess I don't want to see the, the, the treasury uh, business case. If you're Apple and you're banking with JP Morgan Chase, I mean, they're probably quoting you, you know, the you know bips. I mean, like, what is the, what is the two major currencies? The spread is like in bips. A BIP is a one one hundredth of a, a cent, basically. I mean, it's very so tiny. I, just, I, I'm, we'll not, get back. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I understand the. So, so the proponents, and then we'll come back. The proponents of this say, yeah, J.P. Morgan might solve Apple's needs between dollar euro, but are they really doing it between, you know, kind of dollar peso or dollar Kenyan? Uh, Currency. Let's say they're not, and, and the spread there is 10 basis points, 50 basis points. Well, that's going to be, by construction, the, the, the spread, you know, like, that's going to be the violation of arbitrage that will be allowed if you go that way too. Right. So Shimon's saying there's, there's, there's maybe a cost and friction. Um, uh, I think the proponents of this would also say there's a friction in time, that moving from dollars to peso. Remind me your first name. Uh, well, that's definitely true even in pesos or any currency, like all these quotes that anyone's getting are like extremely tight, but there's still a problem like weekends, for example. Weekends, they're just not quoted at all. So like if there's a major event that's happening over a weekend that's going to change the value of your asset or your currency, then you can't trade until Monday or Sunday, Sunday night when Hong Kong opens. And so there's still like these, like a 36 hour time period that is completely unsolved or anything. So the, the, the worldwide currency markets are depending upon banks, and banks do actually have holidays. Um, I know it's sometimes hard to believe, but um, and so there's a question of, of so there's a question of friction, which Shimon would say if it's even if it costs you half a percent, it better get inside of that. Um, uh, there's a question of settlement delay. This could be faster. But you're saying they could change that. J.P. Morgan can change that. And then there's weekends. Do you have a 160-some-hour week? I'm going to go to Alexis and back here. Yeah, I was just thinking, like, because this system, um, like, in the, at the end of the day, like, it depends on the two FX rate, on the two fiat rate, on the, like, normal markets, right? right. So, like, even if we can't trade on a Sunday, like, uh, the rate is going to change on the uh, platform uh, based on the, like, I don't know, the assumption of, like, what the rate is going to be tomorrow. Like, it's going to adjust. Normally, it should adjust, right? Because as, as, as has been raised before, like, it's adjust for no arbitrage to take place. So, like, <coughs> even if it's possible, like, 
doesn't this system like add more risk in terms of like two different risk fiat crypto crypto fiat and just because there will always be the underlying risk of fiat to fiat right. because it's always based on a like price on a private Can I hold your question because I want to see if the other uh, yours comes in I got it it's the risk I was just gonna bring up the accessibility for you know non first world countries or unbanked countries and I would be less concerned about moving over, you know, moving like a yard and like more concerned about like, okay, well maybe I have to transact like sub $100. Do you, do you want to translate for the room what a yard is? I, 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 my Goldman Sachs days, I knew what a yard is, but some of the non-bankers. It's a billion dollars. Sorry. A billion dollars. Now you can work on, what trading floor did you work on? <laughs> city. Now you can work on city. It's a, a yard is a billion dollars on Goldman Sachs' floor too. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, we measured it differently, yeah. Um, but I think it's, if you want, like if you wanted to transact um, maybe like under $100 from, you know, uh, dollars to, you know, whatever, uh, no, no large bank is going to open an account and do that for you. You're going to have to do that for like a commercial bank. If you have access to it, there's a really wide spread there. So if you can do this through an app, through a stable coin or Ripple or whatever, you're going to be able to do it for, for cheaper if you're making like micro transactions. So uh, I'm going to react and then try to bring it all together and summarize. It's the last slide. So uh, uh, Alexis' point about risk. I agree. I think that all of these points are valid, that there is additional cost. There's two hops in this example, uh, and there's additional risk. So the real business case question is, is there enough value added on the other side? Are you shortening settlement cycles? Can you do it on the weekends when you otherwise couldn't do it? Could you move small dollar amounts, maybe retail? Because Western Union still charges something like 8 to 10% to do cross-border remittances. So you send some money to the Philippines and do it only for a couple of hundred dollars, and you're, you're probably spending 10%. Could somebody build inside of those types of, now, $200 movement, 10% is $20. You still have to bring transaction costs down, fixed transaction costs down. But if you can bring the fixed transaction costs down and, and, and deal with, have enough liquidity, it's kind of a, I wouldn't count this out. I'm one who sort of doubts it will be in the heart of treasury function that Apple will be using it between dollar and euro. But I, I want to say that there's the wide spectrum. It's just an interesting, can crypto be a, a, a bridge currency, and might it be in stable in the world of stable value? I, I hope, I mean, this was a good discussion, because this is what the rest of the semester is about. We're going to take use case by use case and really debate. And through it, the learning objective is for all of us to leave with a little critical reasoning skills about when does an append-only log with consensus amongst multiple parties and maybe a native token make sense. That's usually called blockchain, but Aline doesn't let me call it blockchain technology anymore. Uh, next uh, uh, Tuesday is election day. So I'm going to make my pitch. If you're a US citizen, please vote. If you're not, I'm not going to ask you to vote, but please vote. You know, participate in our incredible thing called democracy. But we're going to talk about central bank digital currencies. And so I think we're doing this over two sessions as well. So next Tuesday is going to be a lot about central banking and so forth. So uh, thank you. Happy anniversary, Bitcoin. <laughs>